Good evening, good evening. Welcome to the second seminar of the year. I'm Bob Stein, seminar's chair, and I'm very happy to see you all here. At the outset, I want to give a special shout out to our board. They're all volunteers. They do a great deal of the work which really makes seminars happen, and they're smart. At the end of each seminar season in late August, we have what we call a brainstorming session to pick topics and speakers for the next year. Last August, this board selected Korea as one of our topics and Chris Hill as our speaker. They are perceptive. How about a hand for the board? And you can help us for next year by letting us know if there are topics or speakers you'd like us to consider for 2019. And I'd also like you uh, to please join me in thanking our program administrator, Deb Metcher, who often is the eyes and ears of the seminars, who works with us to make this seminar happen. I also want to send special thanks to our seminar supporting sponsors, Kate and Malcolm Hawk, and also Emily and Tony Seaver. If you are a friend, thank you, and we still welcome new friends for this year as you know, friends can reserve tickets in advance and attend our Dutch tree dinners. This year, this week's is full up, but in the future you can go. It will give you a chance to continue the discussion, ask additional questions of our speaker. Note that if your friends miss this seminar, they can hear it on KUNC Community Radio for Northern Colorado on Sunday, June 29 at 8 p.m. And, uh, I'm sorry, July 29, forgive me. Thank you. Uh, KUNC President and CEO Neil Best is here today. Neil, could you wave? Thank you, thank you. We value our partnership tremendously. And if you missed Stuart Butler last week, his seminar is up on our website, www.seminarsatsteamboat.org. Click on the video audio tab, and voila, there it is. We have our first four seminars in four consecutive weeks. Next Monday, David Sanger of the New York Times will return here, he was here in 2010, to discuss cyber warfare. Another subject which is very much in the news and for which a lot of elucidation will be helpful. As I always say, please turn off your cell phones and I would like to ask Ken Krieg of our board to come up to introduce Chris Hill. Ken. Thanks, Bob. Good afternoon, and let me add my welcome to all of you uh, to this timely discussion on diplomacy in action, U.S. options in North Korea. I note the word discussion because you'll have a chance to participate in by writing questions on papers that will, with pens that will be provided by the staff and passing those along to the center aisles. They will be picked up for all those you, of you who are new. They will be picked up brought forward, and then I'll, I'll uh, ask Chris at the end of the presentation, please work hard. I am, my wife will tell you that I am the worst guy to tell you this. Please write as legibly as possible. Uh, um, Bob was really kind in saying that the board uh, was, was prescient in thinking about this. Last summer when we were talking about to topics, we could all agree on one thing. Asia-US was going to be a hot topic. 
We couldn't agree on whether it was North Korea, the South China Sea, trade, cybersecurity, and intellectual property theft, or a number of others. Who knew that they would all be the right answer? <laughs> so we decided we'd find the right person and give him the opportunity for the stage. Ambassador Chris Hill was that choice, was a natural choice, and obviously the turn of events in the intervening 10 months have made U.S.-North Korean relationships one of the hottest topics we could have at seminars. As they say, even in planning seminars, it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> you have Ambassador Hill's uh, wonderful resume in today's program, so I won't read that to you, but I'd summarize it in this way. If there was a difficult foreign policy issue from the early 90s until 2010, it's likely that Chris Hill was in the middle of it. I asked several of our mutual friends uh, to give me a good story so that I could embarrass him before he came on stage. I, I struck out completely on that. Chris, you have very good friends. Uh, but I repeatedly heard three things. One, if it was hard, he was there. Two, he is nonpartisan and speaks truth to power. And three, his North Star is the American national interest, not his own or anyone else's personal interest. I decided, I decided that was a pretty good introduction and I couldn't say it better. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Ambassador Chris Hill to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ken. And if you want, you can just keep on going. I mean, it worked for me. Anyway, it, it's a great pleasure to be back here in Steamboat to be uh, involved again in the Steamboat seminars and to be at this unbelievable facility here at Springs. I gather it was, uh, it was really built for music. And I don't have a lot of music uh, today, what we're talking about North Korea, but uh, uh, I'll do my best to try to, uh, if it doesn't uh, uh, sing, it uh, may inform. But uh, let me just say, uh, Bob Stein, thank you so much for, uh, for um, inviting me and working with, your, uh, with, with the team here to, to do that. And indeed, uh, I thought this is absolutely not only the summer of North Korea, the month of North Korea, maybe even the week of North Korea, but probably not the day of North Korea. Uh, so I thought maybe uh, in the course of the Q&A, we can talk about um, uh, Helsinki. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the press conference from Helsinki. And so, uh, <laughs> But, but, you know, we're going to do our, our vegetables before we get to the dessert, so I, I, I thought it, it is a good idea to um, talk about uh, where we've come with North Korea and, um, and where, we're, where we're heading. Now, to illustrate it, I, I, will, I want to mention a totally seemingly irrelevant story from... Um, uh, a country that I was uh, assigned to many years ago, uh, actually twice, uh, that is Poland. And uh, even before I got there in the late 50s, there was a Polish party first secretary with the uh, name of Władysław Gomułka, a name that is uh, otherwise kind of lost to history, really. But uh, he was known for very long speeches and not particularly uh, successful me uh, metaphors. So. Uh, one day he got up in front of a crowd in Krakow and said to this enormous crowd who had been waiting a long time for him to come, he said, comrades, just a few years ago, our fatherland stood on the very edge of a deep abyss. And I'm here to tell you today, comrades, that we have taken an important step forward. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I think, I think when we, when we talk about uh, North Korea, when we talk about North Korea, uh, we do have to consider uh, not taking such steps forward, but rather understanding that this is indeed a tough issue, uh, one that is probably 
uh, not going to be solved in a 45-minute one-on-one, uh, and one that, frankly, I think, as a country, we need to kind of coalesce around to, uh, to understand uh, the importance of finding consensus on this issue. Now, um, our president has spoken of the failure of the, of the Clinton era to deal with the problem, that is the Clinton administration, which had something called the agreed framework. And, and then he's spoken about the failure of, uh, of um, President Bush in, in the six party uh, endeavor, which was an effort to get everybody who had a stake in North Korea in the region with the understanding this is not just an American uh, problem, this is a lot of people's problems. And then finally, uh, the, of course, the failure of the, of the last administration, President o Obama, to really make, make progress on the issue as well. And, uh, and that the president would then kind of fix all this. But I think it is informative, if, if not to the president, then perhaps to the rest of us, to understand what happened in these uh, previous endeavors. So very quickly, I'll just keep these to sort of 30 second explanations. Uh, what the Clinton administration sought to do when North Korea, and by the way, this North Korean effort to uh, build a nuclear weapon, it didn't just start with President Trump calling Kim Jong-un rocket man, uh, and nor did it start when President Bush hurt their feelings and said they were part of an axis of evil. Uh, it started really way back in the 60s, and this has been an effort by the North Koreans to build weapons of mass destruction and the question to this day is, well, why? Why are they doing that? And um, I think many people think that they're building nuclear weapons somehow to keep themselves safe. I mean, after all, they are under threat of uh, attack from the US every day, and uh, therefore they need nuclear weapons such that the US would not think of attacking them. Well, I'm here to s suggest to you that the US has not been thinking of attacking North Korea every day. If you talk to any army planner in the uh, US military about what it would involve in going over that uh, uh, fateful 38th parallel again, what the invasion routes might be up to Pyongyang, uh, how we would uh, manage uh, North Korean efforts to infiltrate South Korea and cause kind of havoc in our in our back of our lines. Uh, nobody would be looking forward to an invasion of North Korea. It's understandably uh, thought to be something that would be extremely costly. And so while it would be on the table, especially if North Korea retained its, its nuclear weapons, uh, it's not something that any president has really contemplated, not since, uh, I was going to say not since Harry Truman, but he didn't want, even want to go north of the 38th parallel. That was Douglas MacArthur's idea, who, and he belatedly informed the president after he had done it. So going to uh, uh, invading North Korea can't really be the motivation for why the North Koreans have uh, nuclear weapons as some kind of defensive measure. After all, they're bereft of allies, they need this. So I'm gonna uh, suggest to you that they have wanted nuclear weapons for a different purpose. And that is to say to the US, you are the ally of our cousins, the South Koreans, and you have threatened time and time again to come into a conflict if, if we and the South Koreans get into a pushing and shoving match, you've said that you will be there for the South Koreans, and we're telling you today, not so fast, because if you join in a conflict, if you uh, uh, exercise your alliance, frankly, our obligations under that alliance, to protect South Korea, we will hold your civilians in your cities um, hostage. That is, we are prepared, we the North Koreans are prepared to launch um, thermonuclear weapons with uh, modern uh, uh, solid fuel rockets, multi-stage rockets, and attack your cities. Well, the Americans have said, we've said for a number of years, hey, make my day. You want to attack us, you'll, you know, your country will be a parking lot in no time at all. To which the North Koreans have essentially replied, game on. And uh, when you look at North Korea and you listen to what they say, and not just the KCNA, the, uh, the um, Korean broadcast, the North Korean broadcast system that goes out to the world, but what they say domestically to their people is we North Koreans, 
we, are, we can survive a nuclear attack. We have so much underground. We have dug so many tunnels. It's quite remarkable to go to their subway system, as I have in Pyongyang, and you, you go to the, I asked, I didn't want to go to the Chuche Memorial, which is a sort of kitschy thing with a red star on the top. They wanted to take me to a tourist site, and I said, I'd like to go see your subway. And uh, it went down, if any of you have been to DuPont Circle in Washington, try a subway that's three times deeper than DuPont Circle. I remember talking to my North Korean minder. I said, did the, did the Soviets build this for you? And he said, no, we built it all by ourselves. Um, and the point being, they think that they can tunnel such that they can survive a nuclear war. Pretty crazy stuff, but you have to understand that's part of the mentality of this country that feels that they can survive anything and do anything. So, could they survive a nuclear war? Of course not. Frankly, I think very few countries could survive a nuclear war. But the fact that they believe it is something we have to take note of. Moreover, I think the North Koreans don't really plan to get into a nuclear uh, tussle with us. I mean, they're, they are a lot of things, but they're not stupid. So what would be the scenario? The scenario would be something like an American president says, you know those South Koreans, 10th largest country in the world, one of the 10th uh, largest economies in the world, one of the most ferocious militaries. And for those of you who've had opportunities to work and to uh, see what the uh, Republic of Korea military is like, I mean, they are more capable than most of our NATO forces. I should say most of our NATO forces before our president spoke with the NATO leadership. <laughs> and you know, now it's all different. But as of last week, they were uh, uh, probably more capable than any of our NATO forces. And so, so you can imagine over the course of time, a North Korean uh, uh, leadership that, that makes it clear it's prepared to hit us with a nuclear weapon, makes it clear that it doesn't seem to mind trying that. And then a president, whether this one or the next one or the one after that, thinks, do we really need troops in Korea? I mean, surely the South Koreans can handle this on their own. And so what would be the scenario there? The scenario might be that an American president would say something like, you know, we really don't need troops there. They can handle it. So let's start pulling the troops out. I'll get to what happened in Singapore, but uh, I think we need to understand that the long term, the North Koreans are playing a long game, and the long game is get the US out of, uh, out of South Korea. And so that is the purpose of their nuclear weapons. So I think the Trump administration, came, when they came in, they said, this is easy. We can fix this whole thing. And so sure enough, uh, the president began talking about uh, nuclear war himself. Said, you know, they better not, you know, if they think they have a big nuclear button, get a load of ours. And, uh, and so the consequence was, I think a lot of uh, Americans were thinking, gee, we were thinking of inviting the relatives home for Christmas. Uh, but rather than talk about surviving that, they started thinking, can we survive a nuclear war? <laughs> so it all looked very bleak. It all seemed that our country was heading to war. You know, after all, we have a bigger button than they do. Uh, we sent an armada into uh, the Korean, uh, the, um, the Sea of Japan, except that the armada was actually going to do exercises in Australia, which last time I checked on a map is fairly far away from the uh, uh, Sea of Japan. And so it all, there was a sort of surrealistic thing that was going on in the, uh, in the, uh, at, by the end of 2017. And as I mentioned, we, this history has been around for a while. You had the Clinton administration trying to do a deal and finding that at the end where they got North Korea to freeze their nuclear weapons, suddenly they discovered toward the end of the Clinton administration that North Korea was, was making some imports of uh, materials and, and technology consistent with so-called highly enriched uranium, which is another way to make a bomb. And so the Clinton administration kind of, they kind of pulled back a little and the Bush administration ended what they were doing. 
Then the Bush administration, um, and uh, full disclosure, I was the Foreign Service officer who was designated to work this issue. We worked with other countries on this, with China, with South Korea, with Japan, with Russia. And uh, ultimately, we got them to shut down their reactor. We got inspectors in. We blew up the cooling tower. We did a number of things. And then when we got to the critical point of saying, OK, North Koreans, give us a list of what you got, they excluded any mention of, uh, of their uh, uh, highly enriched uranium purchases. Uh, I asked, you know, could, they, could you have uh, brought them in and then kind of left it in the garage, not unlike some <laughs> Christmas toy that you weren't able to put together? And uh, I said, no, we never, in, uh, never brought it in. At one point, uh, I asked them, I said, uh, Look, we have some examples of this sort of uh, uh, very uh, robust aluminum, uh, sort of an aluminum steel, which would be consistent with, a, with the material you need for a centrifuge. And uh, what happened to that? And amazingly, the North Koreans did not deny having brought in a few tons of that stuff. But they said, well, actually, we use it for uh, missile parts. And uh, I said, can we have a look at the factory? And uh, uh, they, the North Koreans at the time allowed us to, uh, to uh, have um, a couple of people go to the factory. At first, the North Koreans tried to say they use it for knives and forks. Uh, <laughs> But we got through that story, and sure enough, it was for, for, they had some missile parts, so we took some of the material, brought it back to Washington, had our specialized agencies look at it, and, they, and the, the result came back, no, this is not for missiles, this is for centrifuges. And so we said to the North Koreans, okay, but let's see, we need a verification deal where we can go look at things that have been undeclared and uh, sites that are so-called undeclared sites, not sites that we already know about. And that's when the North Koreans balked, and that's when the Bush administration decided to uh, stop trying to negotiate it. It goes to the, uh, to the Obama administration, not a lot happened. So by the end of the 2017, it kind of looked like we were going to uh, get into some kind of shooting match with the North Koreans. And then amazingly, something happened on, on January 1st, uh, 2018, and that is that Kim Jong-un gave a traditional, uh, an, uh, the traditional annual New, New Year's Day address, and he addressed the South Koreans, and he said, we wish you re uh, well with your Olympics, and uh, we would like to make this a safer uh, peninsula. And he made a lot of sort of friendly sounds, and the South Korean leadership under Moon Jae-in a new South Korean uh, president who had been selected only about uh, six months before, with a mandate to try to calm things down on the Korean Peninsula, sent a delegation up to Pyongyang and uh, to sit down with the North Koreans and said, you know, we took note of your, of your comments about uh, wanting us to have a successful Olympics. Can we work on that? And so, indeed, they had a good discussion about it. They worked out an arrangement by which the North Koreans uh, sent an Olympic team and sent an uh, enormous group of uh, cheerleaders. And so, um, at that point, uh, the North Koreans then said one other thing, which they've said every time uh, they've said since the Clinton era. Of course, we would like to have a better relationship with America. We would be pleased to invite, uh, to have, uh, for uh, our leader to have a meeting with, uh, with President Trump. So the South Koreans, frankly, they knew that the same offer had made, been made to George W. Bush, the same offer had been made to Bill Clinton. Uh, the, the South Koreans actually took it right back to Washington. They stopped in Seoul. Uh, repacked and sent a delegation to, uh, to Washington, and they went into uh, General McMaster's office, the National Security Council uh, uh, advisor at the time. Uh, the current one is, is Mr. Kelly, although I think it's even money whether he will survive the week at this point. But uh, anyway, McMaster uh, is conducting this meeting in his office, and in walks President Trump and says, oh, come over to the Oval Office. So the South Koreans, who are frankly a little conscious of protocol and, and rank, were a little reluctant to go into the Oval Office, but President Trump very warmly invited them there. And they told President Trump that uh, Kim Jong-un would, like um, would like to have a meeting with him. 
And he said, without checking with McMaster or checking with the then Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, a name otherwise oh, like Władysław Gomułka, lost to history. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, without checking with anyone, the president said, sure, sounds like a good idea. So um, at that point, amazingly, the issue uh, became who's going to go out in front of the West Wing and make the announcement. Well, uh, none of the president's staff particularly wanted to do that. And so, uh, lo and behold, uh, the president asked the Koreans if they would go out and do it. And so the Korean uh, national security advisor uh, went out and announced that President Trump would be meeting with the North Korean leader. Now, as you recall, it wasn't clear when this was going to happen, and there was a lot of skepticism about whether it was going to happen. But as you recall, it was quite a sensation. And then, of course, you had the North Koreans showing up at the, uh, uh, at the uh, Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. And, uh, you know, suddenly we're in a whole different world. Well, for me, this was a little rich, I got to tell you, because I can recall uh, President Bush, who uh, sent me to Pyongyang and sent me to 48 meetings with the North Koreans. In fact, I invited President Bush to Denver a few years ago, and he accepted and came to the University of Denver. And the first sentence I wrote in my letter to him was, Dear Mr. President, a few years ago you asked me to go to Pyongyang, and now I'm asking you to come to Denver. <laughs> and uh, it worked. It worked. Uh, when you're inviting speakers, you just do what you have to do. Uh, so, um, so it, anyway, uh, at the time, so President Bush really wanted to make some progress. He wanted to work with China. He wanted to get other countries in the, in the region involved because he didn't want a situation where it's just the North Koreans against the US. Because as soon as there's an impasse, people say, come on, Americans, be more flexible. Whereas if it's an impasse between one and five, that's a different matter. So he understood the math of the equation and uh, very much supported what were, became known as the six-party talks. But uh, when I um, went out to, for my first talks with the North Koreans, there's something you have called instructions. And your instructions come in a telegram from the State Department to, in this case, the embassy in Beijing, because the negotiations were being conducted in China and Beijing. And so the subject line was instructions for Ambassador Hill for meeting with the North Koreans. So fortunately, and this is how it works in the State Department, please don't tell Mr. Trump this, but uh, uh, the negotiator writes his own instructions. I guess. President Trump would be okay with that since he was the negotiator at Singapore. But anyway, so I wrote a lot of you know what I felt I could live with. You clear it around the, the building. Everyone says, yeah, that's really what we what we have in mind. Except that I had uh, what you happen. What happens is you send a uh, a telegram, an, un an uncleared and unsent telegram around. You invite other people to join in with various comments. So I had a lot of uh, good advice, such as. If you are in a room with the North Koreans in any, in any meal or any setting and someone proposes a toast, thou shalt not toast. So if you're in China, and any of you who have been to China know you can't go 90 seconds in a meeting without someone raising Mao Tai uh, and, and doing bottoms up. And so I was supposed to sit there with my hands folded while everyone else in the room was toasting champagne or, or some Chinese uh, uh, drink. In short, I was getting instructions to stay as far away as I could from the North Koreans. You will not meet them except when the Chinese are in the room. Great advice like that, as if that's really going to uh, move the process. In short, you should keep them at an arm's, le uh, arm's length. And in getting them to yes, you're essentially, I was being asked to sort of have them uh, stripped down while I give them nothing in, in uh, response. It wasn't going to work. But the irony, the rich irony of that is some of the people who wrote those instructions are the same people who are in the White House today, and I'm referring to the National Security Advisor, the new one, John Bolton. And uh, that is, I think, a very, we can see a very different approach as our president got ready for this, uh, for this meeting in Singapore. 
I can assure you the president wasn't saying to anyone, and when I go there, I'm going to refuse to shake his hand, I'm going to refuse to uh, reciprocate a toast, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the president made very clear, I'm going to size him up real quick, and then I'm going to uh, make him my best friend, and then he's going to give up his weapons because he'll see the uh, proposition in, in, uh, that I've laid out. So um, off to Singapore they go. It was. Uh, there are a couple of dicey moments before they went to uh, Singapore. There was, for example, uh, the National Security Advisor, John Bolton, saying that uh, North Korea should uh, embrace the uh, Libya model. Well, when I was uh, dealing with this back in 2005, uh, John Bolton and many others also talked about the Libya model. But this was 2005. And, um, you know, there were subsequent events in Libya, but in 2005, what had happened was that via a long-standing negotiation facilitated by the Brits, but uh, joined in by various American senior, senior officials, including our assistant secretary at the time from Near East uh, uh, Bureau, Bill Burns, and others sat down with the North Koreans in and with the uh, Libyans in London and worked out a deal by which they would simply give up all of their nuclear uh, equipment. They didn't have any fissile material. They had never made a, a reactor. They had never made a, uh, a, 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 a centrifuges. They've never produced any fissile material. But they said, OK, look, this, we don't want to deal with this. It's all yours. And so we essentially bought back from the Libyans all this stuff. And after we had done that, we then agreed to uh, send a senior official to uh, Tripoli. Uh, and the senior official turned out to be uh, Condoleezza Rice. And she has a hilarious uh, story about uh, meeting Gaddafi for the first time and having him chase her around his tent uh, for <laughs> some time. But she fulfilled her duty of coming to, Singa uh, coming to uh, Tripoli, and that was the contribution. That was the sort of quid pro quo, a senior official. So what uh, uh, John Bolton, who was around in those days and since went off into being a news commentator, so he comes back into government, the first thing he says is they should accept the Libya model, except for the fact that a few things had happened in Libya in the meantime, including a rather unusual state funeral for Muammar Gaddafi. And so, needless to say, this, didn't, this was not um, well received by the North Koreans. Now, of course, they resurrected what they had referred to, um, this is rather unpleasant, but they, back in 2005, when they had their first encounter with John Bolton, they referred to him as human scum. Uh, they have, there's no end to the North Korean capacity to insult people. Uh, although they say, hey, we called them human, what do you want? Uh, so uh, when they saw him up in the net again, and when they saw him with this, in their view, very mischievous uh, proposal that uh, they should follow the Libya model, they were not amused. And then a few days later, you recall the vice president, Vice President Pence, also referred to the Lib Libyan model. And so at that point, the North Koreans were sort of worried, whoa, this Boltonism is spreading, and this is going to be a disaster. We're not sure we're going to go through with this. Well, the president very quickly put, put an end to that concern. First of all, he, in, he invited uh, uh, the uh, kind of second-ranking um, uh, North Korean Kim Jong-chol to uh, New York, where he met with uh, our uh, Secretary of State, who by that time had already made two, I'm sorry, three visits to, uh, to North Korea. And Kim Jong-chol brought with him a, 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 um, an envelope which had a message in it from, uh, from uh, uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, Kim Jong and um, for me, it was kind of interesting to watch because they said, Kim Jong-chol said, my instructions are I must uh, deliver this message in person. Whereupon Secretary Pompeo um, told the president, and the president said, of course. So Kim Jong-chol is invited to the White House. Now I'll give you an example of what I was dealing with back in 2005, actually it was 2007. I said to um, Condoleezza Rice, it would really help me if I could have a letter from the president. She ran it up the flagpole. The president said, I'm not writing no letter to Kim Jong-il. And so the problem was uh, 
of course, that I needed something to take to the, to the meeting. So I said, I counterproposed with Secretary Rice. And I said, how about if he sends five letters to all of the six party, all the other six party members, one of them, of course, to the North Korean leader, and then I'll carry that when I go to Pyongyang next week. So uh, Condi, who uh, we all called her Condi, she developed a pretty good uh, sense of rolling her eyes at some of these ideas, said, all right, I'll do it. And so sure enough, I had a letter from President Bush, and I took it to North Korea. And I said, I have a letter for your leader. Take me to your leader. And uh, because my instructions are, I must deliver it to him in person. So the, uh, the uh, deputy foreign minister said, it's not possible. He's out of town. I said, that's not a problem. I will wait. And then uh, they said, he is far out of town. <laughs> and I said, not a problem. I will go wherever he is because I have an important letter. It was actually sort of the same, it was the same letter that everyone else got, but I thought it was worth a try. And uh, so the North Koreans dug in. And we're about two hours from our departure. We were there for two days. So I spoke to the representative on my team from the National Security Council staff, uh, Paul Hanley. And Paul said, you know, we're supposed to deliver that letter. And he said, it was a nice try on having to give it to, the, uh, to uh, Kim Jong-il himself, but it really was not in our instructions. And I said, don't do it too loudly for the walls. But so we find, so Eventually, with two hours to go, I went to the foreign minister and I said, I have great news. We've received new instructions and I can give the letter to you. Um, anyway, the North Koreans didn't have to go through with any of that. Uh, they uh, took their letter, which was, by the way, a normal size letter, except it was in a uh, uh, 13 by 20 envelope. It looked like one of those game show things. You know, you want a new dishwasher or something. But, uh, uh, and the president agreed to meet him. So all seemed to be OK. But I was, I was asking people, um, do we have a, uh, some sense of what they're prepared to agree, uh, agree to? Because I thought it was kind of important. I mean, we've, all, we've gotten all this from the South Koreans, who really want this whole problem to calm down. But we hadn't heard really directly. Pompeo had been there, but at no time did he say something like, they told me that. He said, they indicate that. You always have to be careful when people use words like indicate rather than said. Uh, and uh, so sure enough, there was no real, real um, indication, if you will, that they were prepared to give up their nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, Pompeo, uh, Secretary Pompeo asked, uh, uh, a person who was my deputy, now the ambassador in, in uh, Philippines, uh, Sung Kim, if uh, he would uh, uh, go to North Korea in the week before the, uh, the um, uh, Singapore summit, I wrote to Sung and I said, uh, I, I wrote to him and I said, uh, Sung, I got three words for you, draft joint communique. Let's see if we can have an agreement on what's going to be the outcome of the summit. Because you know, normally a summit, especially a summit which is at those kinds of high stakes, you know, when you're pulling a rabbit out of a hat and everyone says, my goodness, that's brilliant. Well, it's brilliant except that rabbits don't live in hats. Somebody took some time to stuff the rabbit down the hat. And so, and those people are called diplomats. And, and so, so, So I, and, and Sung, uh, who had worked with me for too long and knew that when I wasn't doing baseball metaphors, I was doing metaphors like that, he said, I don't know something to that effect. So anyway, the president arrives in, uh, in Singapore, and this whole edifice of our policy toward North Korea, that of isolating them, was gone. I mean, there is no isolation from North Korea. If you want to go see the leader of North Korea, you better take a number, because uh, he is meeting everybody right now, because the isolation is essentially over. And so he meets with the president. And strangely, there's no, um, there, there is no prepackaged uh, joint agreement. That is, they went in without knowing what the outcome was going to be. And so, um, I mean, one of the questions, I, if, if I believe that 
there was anyone in the universe who had lived before me, I would have taken what they had done, take our six-party statement, for example, from, uh, 2000, from September 2005, and I would have said to the North Koreans, here is the statement you agreed to in which you agreed to abandon all your nuclear weapons and all your nuclear programs and return to the non-proliferation treaty. Here's what you agreed to in those days. Do you still agree to this? If not, what do you not agree with? You can get kind of an, uh, an idea of what they, what they don't agree with and what, or what they still do agree with. We had a, a, a line in there about how the US and North Korea would agree to live peacefully together. We had a line there about hey, establishing diplomatic relations. We even had a line there about, uh, uh, about having a uh, treaty with um, a treaty that would, uh, uh, in effect, replace the armistice that ended the Korean War and really be an end to that war. So all of that was there. The question would have been to say to the North Koreans, what part of this, which they've, they've rejected in the intervening years since 2008, but what part of this do you agree with and what part do you not agree with? Instead, they sit down and produce out of whole cloth a whole other statement. But I think people who had watched this, who had looked very carefully at this statement in Singapore, realized it didn't really come close to uh, the statements that were reached in the past, including the one in September uh, 2005. For example, it talks about North Korea's willingness to give up, a, uh, give up its nuclear weapons, but it does not address the question of when. Now, in the 2005, it didn't say when, but it said return to the non-proliferation treaty at an early date, meaning they come back in the non-proliferation treaty and the only status they could have in returning is a non-nuclear state. It's kind of all spelled out there. Some of it's kind of code, but you can, you can figure it out. So uh, in the Singapore statement, it wasn't at all clear that they were agreeing to give up nuclear weapons. Now, the North Koreans have a kind of Marxist notion, lo and behold, of giving up uh, nuclear weapons. For, uh, for example, in Marxist ideology, you talk about the state withering away to be replaced by the Communist Party. That is the point at which you have pure communism. In the meantime, you have something communists refer to as socialism, which we see as communism, just pure communism. And that is where you have a state existing alongside a, a party structure, which is what every communist party that's still in existence uh, uh, has. So they talk about eventually withering away. Um, you also have these concepts in the Bible that, you know, when the lambs lie down with the lions, you know, that's when we'll have denuclearization. In short, there was no effort to uh, set out a time, a time frame there. And uh, what was rather odd, I was, at, I was uh, spending the, the night, literally, at uh, NBC Studios, and they had asked me to be there for, uh, to provide some commentary. So at uh, 2 a.m., 2 a.m. our time in New York, uh, 2 p.m. in uh, Singapore time, um, it was revealed that there was going to be a, a, a signing, but no one even knew what the signing was about. Were they exchanging autographs? What were they going to do? So there was this big mahogany table and a couple of these big uh, leather portfolios and a, and a uh, huge double door in the background. And so we got the impression there was going to be a signing ceremony, but we didn't know what they were actually going to sign. So this was at 2 in the morning, our time. Uh, and so uh, Kim Jong-un and President Trump walk out. They sit down. Uh, Kim Jong-un's sister, who made famous during the uh, uh, Seoul Olympics, she was there to turn the portfolio and show her brother uh, where he is supposed to sign. In our case, we had our Secretary of State doing that for President Trump. There was some asymmetry there, but whatever. And, uh, and then, amazingly, President Trump, uh, no one knew what they were signing or uh, the speculation. It, I, was, I was next to David Gura, who was the uh, NBC um, uh, anchor at that, at that point. They had all night coverage. And so David turned to me and said, do you know what they're signing? I said, I don't know. Beats the heck out of me. We'll have to find out. And then President Trump held up the statement, and someone used an iPhone, took a picture of the statement, and beamed it around the world. We were able to read the statement off of the iPhone photograph. <laughs> and, uh, 
and so uh, I'm sitting there with David Gura at this NBC at 30 Rock at this uh, large table, and someone comes in and throws a statement at me, and I start reading it, and I realized this was a fairly incomplete thing, and that uh, there was certainly a lot of goodwill involved in the statement. You could see that from the North Korean side. You could certainly see that from President Trump's side. But it was not a roadmap, really, for going forward. So um, what happened uh, was the next question, and people who know this kind of stuff, David Sanger from the New York Times, you know, there are a lot of these journalists who follow this program for this issue for half their, half their lives. Uh, they took a, uh, they began to say, well, you know, this doesn't come close to what they agreed in 1992 or what they agreed in 2005. And the only thing that was clear about it was it said, Secretary Pompeo will continue the diplomatic work. And then when you say, okay, let's see if the North Koreans did any prep work ahead of this time. And then they said a player to be named later, or words to that effect, from North Korea would be in charge of their delegation. It's turning out to be Kim Jong-chul, but it wasn't at all clear from the, uh, from the statement. So after this whole Singapore fling, if you will. Uh, the decision was then, we're going to go ahead, but how do we go ahead? Now, President, now uh, Secretary Pompeo went back. This time, I'm, I lose track, but I think actually he had gone twice before. This was his third trip. Um, and by comparison, no other sitting secretary except for Madeleine Albright at the very end of the Clinton administration has ever been to North Korea. And already this Secretary of State has been there three times in a tenure that's been about four months, if my memory serves me correctly. So um, uh, Secretary uh, Pompeo actually uh, has been a, is a guy who does reach out to people and does try to kind of uh, sample other people's opinions about this, uh, regardless of uh, you know which administration you were working in or what you were what you were doing at the time. So he called me up and uh, asked me what I thought he ought to do. And I said, well, the first thing is we need a clear statement. I didn't mean that what, was ha what happened at Singapore was not clear, but I think he got the point. And I said, you know, you're going to need a clear understanding of what the North Koreans are prepared to accept and prepared to do. And I told him, I would suggest you start off with a complete listing of their nuclear programs. I, rec I recalled to him that when we tried to get that in the summer of 2008, uh, the North Koreans had refused to include uh, highly enriched uranium, that other way to a bomb. They had all the plutonium stuff all in there, but they didn't have the highly enriched uranium. So I told them, if you could get highly enriched uranium in a North Korean statement, even if the statement's incomplete in other ways, that would be the first time they've actually overtly admitted it officially, and that would be valuable if you could do that. We then had a discussion about one of the key things uh, that one has to um, consider, and that is how do you put together a team of people? Um, he suggests, he, uh, I think, representing the fact that he is, you know, by certainly by standards of this administration, he is very ecumenical. He wants to get as many people involved as possible, try to work with others. And so I told him uh, that I thought uh, he should try to get various elements of the administration in, even though many of us suspect that the current National Security Advisor, John Bolton, unless he's had some kind of, uh, you know, Saul to Paul type uh, 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 falling off of his horse somewhere, uh, he's probably still dead set against this. So I, I, I won't say what he said, but I'll say what I said, which is he, uh, you know, you have to be careful about bringing people who are dead set against something inside the tent, because we all know the uh, LBJ aphorism that somehow it's better to have people in the tent than out of the tent. For, and I said, yeah, but sometimes they uh, can mess up the sleeping bags and everything. So you better be <laughs> careful about who you bring in the tent. So we had a little discussion about that. But I, I found it very gratifying that the Secretary of State was thinking about these issues. And, um, and then uh, I told him, um, and I keep saying I did this because I don't really want to, you know, he, he can speak for his, himself. I'm not going to say what he said. But I, 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 I told him that I thought 
The biggest issue emanating from Singapore is the fact that there is no regional architecture yet. That is, if the US thinks it can talk to North Korea, sort everything out in North, with the North Koreans, um, and then go to the Chinese and tell them belatedly, I oh, just want to give you an update on how we're doing with the North Koreans, that's not going to work with China. And frankly speaking, it's not going to work with South Korea, and it's certainly not going to work with, with Japan. So I think it's very important that as, they go for, as the administration goes forward, they work out a way, if they don't want to call it the six-party talks, because everything has to be sort of uh, dreamed of for the first time ever in human history by the current administration, fine, call it something else. Uh, I always remember the, uh, North, the uh, Russian interpreter in our six-party talks. He was never comfortable with the term uh, working group, so whenever he was translating the, the, um, into English from Russian, he would say, the working groups, and then he would pause and say, that is to say, the groups at work. Uh, <laughs> so I understand they don't want to do six parties. Then talk party of six, whatever you need to do. But you need to get a sense of the regional architecture. And I know there are a lot of people who say, why would we ever want to deal with China in this? Well, I tell you, uh, working with China is hard. Working against China is pretty near impossible, especially when you're talking about issues that are right on their border. And so I think we need to be respectful. I didn't tell him that, but I'm telling you this. Uh, we need to be respectful of the fact that we're not the only uh, country with equities there. And I did say, because while this wasn't in that Singapore statement, uh, it was in the president's press conference in Singapore in which he said that he would um, put an end, he would cancel uh, the U.S. Uh, Republic of Korea exercises. And uh, I suggested that, um, first of all, the president learned to speak some North Korean because he said, uh, he said, we will cancel the uh, war games. Uh, uh, which are the uh, hostile uh, war games, which is only an expression the North Koreans uh, use. So um, I, I felt that in announcing that, having talked about it with the North Koreans, it's all fine except he was talking to the wrong Korea. He should have been talking to the South Koreans about the question of do you think, would you be, do you think it's a good idea to postpone exercises for this year such that uh, they will not be an irritant while we're trying to move forward on the, uh, on the uh, nuclear talks. And I'll bet the South Koreans would go along with it. I don't think they would be thrilled about it. The North Koreans asked me all the time about canceling exercises. And I would uh, say I got to the point, I got kind of sarcastic with them, which is uh, something that happens when you deal with the North Koreans. And I said, you know, I do have a regret about our exercises, that is, that we didn't have them in the spring of 1950. So, um, so I can, they have, they have approached, they have asked this question about exercises of everybody. And you can picture the scene saying, and we request that the war games conducted uh, by the uh, US and their so-called allies be canceled. I can imagine them kind of reading this from rote, and the president says, done, and they kind of look up saying, my gosh, first time ever we've gotten an affirmative answer to that question. I think it sends a, a signal of weakness, and I worry about that. But I think what the president then said was even more worrisome, which is, we want to bring our troops home. And uh, that comment uh, just went through South Korea even among people who think North Korea is the greatest place in the world, and there are, sadly, some South Koreans who really feel that if the foreigners would only get out, South Korea and North Korea could work this out. But even those people, I think, had a little problem with the idea of withdrawing uh, US forces. And you know, an American, anyone can make a comment like that, but when you're president, yeah, when you are a president and you make that comment, a lot of people are listening and taking it with the utmost seriousness. First of all, the Japanese. The Japanese have worried about this whole process from the start. 
I was in Japan uh, last uh, November, and they said, you know, we've been very tough, but we really are worried that your administration, we will be out there very tough, and then your administration will change, and we will, we will change its view, and we will still be out there on our own. The Japanese had a lot of concerns and have even greater concerns. So it fell to Mr. Pompeo not only to visit North Korea again, but to also try to tamp down these issues with the neighbors. And uh, I think in, in the process, try to come to terms with the need for some sort of architecture in the region. I guess the, the fundamental question we all have is, is this going to lead to anything? I mean, after all, North Korea has been at this for 60 plus years. And will they give up their nuclear weapons? I mean, this is the question everyone asks. Um, my own view is yes. It is not uh, an unqualified yes. They're not going to say it at a 45-minute meeting in Singapore. Uh, they're not even going to say it in the course of a two-day uh, uh, meeting in Pyongyang uh, with the Secretary of State. But I think the fundamental proposition that has to be put forward to the North Koreans is, would you be better off with these weapons or without these weapons? With the understanding that we put forward a series of very tough measures. We put forward the idea that without these weapons, if you give up these weapons, we are prepared to do a lot with you, including civil nuclear program including civil nuclear, that is, nuclear, nuclear reactors to help power. So we're prepared to do to that. We're prepared to help you trade. We're prepared to integrate you in the international uh, community. We are not prepared to do any of that if you continue with your nuclear weapons. And if you do continue with your nuclear weapons, we will come after you wherever you are. If you have, think you have trouble opening bank accounts today, just wait, because we will make sure that no bank in the world is going to ever open a North Korean bank account again. If you try to open a bank account on the moon, we will build a rocket ship, or maybe those SpaceX people will build a rocket ship, go, back, go up to the moon, and shut down that bank account as well. We will make your lives a living hell as long as you keep these nuclear weapons. So I think if you put forward that kind of proposition, a series of sticks and a series of carrots, it won't happen overnight because the North Koreans feel they've really ex accomplished something with nuclear weapons. But it is also to say that they really need to understand that we will not let this problem go. And to those people, such as John Bolton, I hate to keep picking on him, but why not after today? Uh, <laughs> To those people who think they're really tough and say things like, they'll never give up their nuclear weapons, and as if to prove their proposition, undermine every negotiation aimed at giving up their nuclear weapons, they are not doing this country any service whatsoever. We need to empower our negotiators to do what they need to do. We need to be prepared to, if we have to shake hands with the North Koreans, we should shake hands with the North Koreans. If we have to toast with them, we should toast with them. But we need to keep in sharp focus what the aim is. And the aim is to make it clear to them that there will be a series of, of sticks and carrots aimed at making sure they understand that keeping those nuclear weapons will be a strategic mistake. So whether we get there in this administration, I cannot say for sure. Uh, whether we get through another day with this administration, I cannot be, be sure. But what I am sure is if those people who understand the overall dynamics of this problem, who understand that nuclear weapons in the hands of North Korea is unacceptable, we cannot accept a few nuclear weapons, we have to get to a zero option. We have to be bold in that kind of thinking. But we also have to come together and try to work these things out whether it's Secretary Pompeo, whether it's, uh, whether it's Madeleine Albright, people need to come together on this issue and understand that whoever gets the credit for this eventually. And I, I think, you know, in diplomacy, when good things happen, it's not because one person did something. It's like a scientific invasion, a uh, scientific uh, invention. Not one person made a scientific invention. Someone made the penultimate invention that allowed the next invention. So there needs to be a much more ecumenical approach to this. 
Uh, we need to have a president who understands that it is useful to call his predecessors. It is useful to his success to call his predecessors and understand what his pre predecessors went through because North Korea with nuclear weapons is a danger to our interests. It's a danger to our regional interests in Northeast Asia. And frankly, we need to deal with this problem. And as for dealing with countries like China, this is not easy, but China is going to be around for a while, maybe as long as we're going to be around. And uh, you know, perhaps we should think in terms of North Korea as an issue that brings the US and China together. I've often said if um, we should someday build a statue to a North, the North Korean leadership for helping to bring the US and China together. Because if, we, if our two countries can't work together and work together a lot better than what we're doing right now, I think we're going to leave ourselves in a situation where the world is not an easier place to live in. So with those comments, maybe we can go to a more interactive uh, procedure. Thank you very much. Do you want to do handheld or that? Hey, this is fine. Am I good on time? Did I, did I, is I, okay. Because I, 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 I have plenty of time. So. That's great. Great. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for those uh, fabulous remarks. As uh, the, um, cards are coming up. I, I want to do a little advertising. In the back of the room, there's a, there's a and then later uh, on, if they're not all sold out, down at, uh, down at the bookstore downtown, there's Outpost, a diplomat at work, where you can get 25 years of this experience, not just one, one set. But uh, I picked it up today. I know what I'll be doing on my next couple of trips. By the way, Ken, I think writing a book is one of the most shameless businesses uh, one can do, but I, I do want to make the advertisement. I wrote every word of that book, and I, I you know, uh, I did use spell check, but uh, hopefully you use an editor now and then too. <laughs> but I wrote it all. And Fabulous, all. thank you. Well, you opened it up with I think the question that everybody has on their mind. Uh, in the last three weeks, we've had four weeks, we've had a challenging G7, we've had a difficult NATO meeting, and today we had uh, an, an interesting session. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, when the administration started, I thought, you know, every administration goes through a learning curve. And I thought that given the fact that our president has not had uh, government service or military service, um, I'll stop there, uh, that this would be a steeper learning curve than, than uh, some of the others. I, I think I was way too optimistic. And uh, <laughs> I think what we're seeing, what we saw in the treatment of our allies, uh, which actually started with uh, Justin uh, Trudeau um, and has continued throughout, is it's, it's a president who I, whatever one thinks of his personal attributes, he, is, he has not understood the meaning of the fact that he serves the state. And when you serve the state, it's, you know, you can have personal opinions. I mean, uh, believe me, if you had invited me 10 years ago, I wouldn't have said uh, a tenth of what I said today because you represent the state and you have to understand that there are issues that are, uh, you know, that represent U.S. government policy and you have to be respectful of what U.S. government policy is. And you don't say, well, you know, the state, that's me and I'll just make my own policy. And so I think to some extent the president has not come to, gra come to, come to grips with the fact that he's the chief executive and as such, um, he has to um, manage others, manage others' uh, opinions, and sometimes different opinions. I can remember George W. Bush. I wanted him to raise some aircraft issue. We were trying to sell uh, F-16s to Poland. And I said, I really want you to raise uh, the, those, uh, the issue of selling F-16s to Poland, which, by the way, were made in, in Fort Worth, uh, Texas. And he said, you really want me to mention airplanes at this summit meeting with the Polish uh, president? 
And he, was, he didn't want to have to do that, and he felt it looked bad because he's talking about planes that are essentially fabricated in his own state, and he kind of felt that was the wrong thing to do. And, and um, a number of people, including Secretary Rice, made the point that, uh, look, we are up against competition, and they press uh, for their planes, and besides that, we want Poland to have NATO plane, uh, an American plane so they can fly with us, and that is part of why uh, we have allies so that we can, you know, fight uh, side by side. And the president did it, even though it was completely contrary to his instincts. I think uh, this President Trump needs to be more respectful when people come up and say, you got to do this. He may not like it, but he needs to understand that we have policies, we have a government where people have thought these things through. And so I think what we've seen in the last uh, few weeks is a president who's become, it's gotten worse and he's become a little less tethered uh, than before. And I'm afraid it's not going to get better until some other people step up and show some guts and be prepared to say, no, that's wrong. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry to riff on about this, but it drives me crazy. I. I a few years ago, I was promote. I can't remember what job it was, but I had lunch with someone who, who uh, um, was deeply tied to Poland. Someone named Zbigniew Brzezinski, <laughs> and uh, Brzezinski, uh, I had known him since I was Polish desk officer, and he'd very kindly see the Polish desk officer, he saw me, saw my predecessor, saw my successor, and he said, "Chris, congratulations on this new job." But uh, I hope you understand that these jobs are all temporary and that uh, whether you serve in the job for two years, three years, even four years, you'll go back to normal life. I mean, you, you, these jobs, this is coming from a very wise man, uh, Dr. Brzezinski. And he said, so the issue is you have to think of these jobs as platforms for things you want to do, you want to accomplish, and you want to get done. And if you start worrying, well, if I say this thing, then I won't get to the next job, you're probably not going to get anything done. And so what you really need to do is be prepared to step down whenever you feel you have to, because uh, sooner or later you're going to leave anyway. So do it on your terms and do it uh, because you've stood up and, and uh, you know, <laughs> made the right point. Great. Thank you. I want to combine a couple in the context of what does security future look like on the peninsula, right? So negotiating to a future yeah. scenario. There's on the one hand the the Korean, the North Korean insistence that U.S. troops come out. Yeah. That obviously is disconcerting to the South Koreans. But on the other hand, there's the question of what provides protection for the new North Koreans if they give up their weapons. Right. Do you see a way to put the thread through that yeah. needle hole. You know, it's, look, that's why these issues don't get solved in a 45-minute meeting. But uh, uh, certainly, over the years, we have told the South Koreans, you do not need a nuclear weapon. By the way, not every South Korean has agreed with that proposition. But we've told them over the years, you don't need a nuclear weapon because we have something called the nuclear umbrella. And an attack on you is an attack on all. And so uh, we are there for you. And so we make clear that our nuclear umbrella extends to uh, South Korea. The issue you're asking is, does North Korea get a nuclear umbrella? And uh, I bet that in the context of kind of a negotiation with the reg regional players there, whether it's China, Russia, US, Japan, I am convinced we can work out something that functions in, that, in those terms. If North Korea does get to the point where um, they uh, give up their nuclear weapons, uh, first of all, we have to stand up for what we agreed to. And the successor to whoever makes the agreement can't just walk out on it. And of course, I have in mind another agreement in another part of the world, uh, Iran. And uh, I think as a country, we need to stop personalizing these issues and understand when the president makes a decision, you don't just undo that decision on the next, uh, uh, the next president. So, 
Now, whether we can get to the point where agreements are then ratified, uh, they're called treaties and ratified by two-thirds of the Senate, beautiful. If that can be done, they should do that. Uh, but uh, I think if we can create a situation where people believe that this agreement holds through our elections, uh, you know, if we can create a situation where everyone thinks this will agree, this will hold through the second, you know, Sarah Palin administration, uh, I think that's the kind of situation we want to have that uh, uh, they, can, they can believe us. And then finally, with respect to if they're denuclearized, we can then look at various uh, uh, non-nuclear, you know, sort of, uh, uh, sort of mutually balanced force reductions, uh, confidence building measures. I can imagine they pull back troops from the 38th parallel. We could pull back troops from the 38th parallel. I'm sure we could take some measures, but it has, has to be done in the context of denuclearization. Good, thank you. Um, you sort of spoke to it. In North Korea, the state is the regime. The regime is the family, sort of, and it's yeah. definitely the leader. What can you tell us about Kim Jong-un that provides insight into the big switch over the, the last months in his personnel, in his approach to the outside world? Yeah, I think, I don't think people make those big switches. And so I think we have to ask the question, were we right about him before? And are we right about him uh, today? I think for Kim Jong-un, uh, to understand how he thinks. I've talked to North Korean defectors, including the guy who uh, defected from their embassy in, uh, in London. And uh, he in particular said, this is not about you Americans. It's not even about South Korea. It's about his competition with his deceased father and his mm -hmm. deceased grandfather. Mm -hmm. And what you have to understand is when Kim Jong-un talks about unifying the peninsula, it's in effect a criticism of his grandfather for failing to do that. Or when he talks about the need for North Korea as a nuclear state, it's a criticism of, of his father for failing to complete the task. So um, I think that is still where his mentality is. And I think he has reason to believe that somehow we will accept some residual uh, nuclear force in, in North Korea. And that's essentially why he's had this change of heart but I don't think it's a change of heart based on the zero option of uh, doing away with his nuclear weapons. And uh, I think that process, which as I laid out a few uh, minutes ago, I think is we can convince people that they have better life without nuclear weapons than with them. But we have to be very clear about it and very prepared to follow through on it and to keep coming after them until they really see the, uh, uh, the truth in it. And so. Um, I don't think we have a changed Kim Jong-un, but we do have a changed climate in which our president is absolutely invested in success here. But I mean, to be successful is to, I think, press even harder on what, what they were calling maximum pressure, so. Given the statements, I think, uh, about uh, ending the exercises for the moment that surprised everybody in the administration, yeah. including Secretary Mattis, who yeah. then went off with Pompeo to say some things. What's your sense of where the military relations with South Korea are, and what do you think about exercises in the future? Yeah. I think uh, South Korea is, a, uh, like many countries, per perhaps including our own, is a deeply divided society today. Uh, I think uh, Moon Jae-in, who is the, the president and head of their progressive party. And by the way, to understand South Korean politics, the, the left in South Korea, they tend to be the sort of anti-foreigners and the, the supporters of closer relationship with North Korea. It's the right that tends to be pro-foreign and in favor of a tougher relationship with, uh, with North Korea. So I think they have a deeply divided split I think the, um, the right, if you will, uh, lost because, um, frankly, uh, Park Geun-hye, the last president, she's in prison today on uh, the conviction charges for some, some corruption, which did not redoubt to her, but redoubt, whatever the past of redoubt is, uh, to, her, uh, to her friends. And so um, I think that really hurt the right but I think they could be back depending on the economy next, uh, next election. Um, I think 
what to understand the Korean military, however, is to understand a military that deeply appreciates the relationship with the United States, understands it's important, understands how the relationship with the United States has really been a force multiplier for Korea's influence in the world. I think there are a lot of people in Korea who understand that. And so I don't look to see any lasting changes in our relationship coming from the Korean side. I'm more worried coming from this side because if Americans can't be, if it cannot be explained uh, why we have troops in Country X, what we're doing, I think sooner or later there will be pressure to remove those troops from Country X. And so I think it behooves anyone who believes it not to do this sort of, uh, we have them because we need them, you know, this sort of mansplaining that goes on over the years. I think there needs to be a much more comprehensive effort to lay it out for the American people and understand why this is a damn good investment. And by the way, a lot of our expenses in South Korea are paid for by the South Koreans, such that there's no big benefit to bringing those troops to Fort Hood in Texas. China. You mentioned that obviously China, as part of a framework, has to be, has to be part of this. What, is, what should our policy toward China with respect to North Korea be, and how in particular do you deconflict individual policy proposals as you approach a strategy like a China relationship? Uh, there is no question that China over the years has stolen our intellectual property rights. There's no question that they have taken advantage of us in trade terms. There's no question that for this trading relationship with China to be sustainable, things needed to change. So as a sort of a proposition, I think that's a fact. The problem I have with it and with a lot of things today is how it's being done and whether it's being done in a way to maximize our interests elsewhere. And uh, I think this so-called trade war with China is a very big mistake. And I am not suggesting we should ignore what they have done on intellectual property rights over the years. And I'm not suggesting that we should somehow um, uh, simply um, you know, have business as usual with, with China because no country can sustain these kinds of deficits. But I think we also need to understand that if we need China's pro help in a question like North Korea, we need to have a serious discussion with the Chinese. And we have to have a, ch a serious discussion that is not crowded out by trade issues. And that's kind of what we're getting right now. China has worried about North Korea's demise. They know it's brittle. You know, usually uh, very strong totalitarian societies are strangely weak. And so I think China's understood that. So why are they worried about North Korea? They're, you know, American newspapers used to always talk about, oh, they're worried about North Korean refugees. China's 1.4 billion. There are 22 million North Koreans. Even if the last North Korean, you know, shut off the lights and came <laughs> into China, I don't think that's the issue. I think it's far more complex. One, for all of China talking about, uh, you know, they always, you know, we hear this from Xi Jinping, and they always want win-win. Uh, they don't know what win-win is. They think it's a, you know, Burmese dissident or something. What they really, <laughs> what they really see is if, if North Korea is taken over by South Korea, that's a win for America and a, and a defeat win, and a loss for China. And I think they worry very much how that would look. It's not that their system has anything to do with the North Korean system. It doesn't. But uh, the perception is that was their part of the Korean Peninsula, and we have our part, and our part wins. That looks bad for them. So I think that goes on. And I think also the situation, you know, China is complex. I know Xi Jinping has been amassing a lot of power. There's a lot of concern with the abolition of the uh, limited term. A lot of concerns about how he's managing things. But I think we also need to understand that that's a big country with a lot of churn politically. And uh, so if the Marxist-Lenin, if the neighboring Marxist-Leninist state goes down, how does that affect the domestic debate within China? 
Now, for many Americans, we just so beats the heck out of me. We'll see what happens. That's not a good enough answer for people who went through the Cultural Revolution and who know the problem of ideological struggle within China and what it has meant in terms of uh, China's uh, history. So all this argues, in my view, for a sophisticated approach to the Chinese, to sit down with them, to kind of lay out what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, uh, to listen to their point of view, make adjustments as we need to. I remember sitting with George W. Bush in a meeting in, in Australia during uh, one of these international meetings, and Hu Jintao, this um, Chinese uh, Secretary General who, if he ever had charisma, it cleared up a long time ago, I tell you. Uh, and, uh, and so President Bush is sitting with him and he said, uh, Mr. President, referring to Hu Jintao, he said, I just want to let you know I'm going to have the Dalai Lama at the house. I'm going to meet him in the family quarters, so it won't be an official meeting. I just want you to know I don't want any surprises between us. I want it clear to you, though, that it's important to some of our people that I have the Dalai Lama at the White House, but not to worry, it'll be in the family quarters. And so Hu Jintao was kind of shocked. He's looking around for his notes. And then President Bush says, you know, I know this is tough. I know you don't agree with what I'm doing, but I have to do it. And he kind of lays it out. And ultimately, the Chinese, OK, we got it. And uh, President Bush was true to his word, too. He didn't make any big political thing. He didn't talk about independence for, for uh, Tibet. He didn't go into Taiwan and these kinds of questions. He was respectful of what the Chinese say are their core interests, but he kind of laid this stuff out and explained what, what our thinking is. We need to have more of these kinds of discussions with the Chinese. And the trouble is today, you know, with this trade issue, I mean, every, every time we talk to them, you know, it becomes sort of a Christmas tree of issues. You know, don't forget cars, don't forget this or that. And, and before you know it, uh, you're kind of bogged down and you don't really make the progress with China. Look, I think North Korea will eventually be, be uh, resolved, I think. And I think when we look back and see how we resolved it, it will be resolved because we had a good working relationship with China, not a bad working relationship. Great, one last question to the notion of clarity of discussion. And, and in particular, in reference to the Wizard of Oz and, Oz and behind the curtain, you know, how representative is what the general public learns about how work gets done in Washington and elsewhere? They get it increasingly in segmentation of media and in articles where opinion and news are blurred. But you know, from your perspective, how, what, what, how much do people get to learn about what is actually happening yeah. behind the curtain? It's a very important question. Um, you know, and it's not a question of right or left in this country. I mean, I, I read, um, you know, newspaper editorials from, you know, national newspapers associated with. Uh, with liberalism, and it's usually stuff like, you know, the U.S. government needs to tell those people this or that, you know. Well, you know, try going into a room where tr you're trying to get someone to come around on the other, uh, to another point of view, and you're just kind of hitting them, you know, very hard on these things. And they, at a certain point, they kind of tune out. You know, you've got to be willing, you know, even in that example I gave of the Dalai Lama, the president asked, I mean, he talked to them, he said, look, this is what I want to do, because, you know, and, and they got it. I mean, and I think there needs to be, uh, you know, we, we are, we're a country, you know, you ask many people abroad, you know, what do you think of Americans? And, uh, you know, and, you know, traditionally, you wouldn't have people answering, well, Americans are extremely ideological and you can't do business with them. That would not have been the answer in the past. It was sort of, Americans haven't uh, been so involved with the history that they carry grudges forever. Americans actually have a kind of ingenuity to them and they try to get stuff done and they're really in, in favor of kind of moving forward on issues. That, that would be kind of our reputation, a sort of, you know, we, we put together a lot of things on the fly, but we're sort of a MacGyver nation. You know, we, okay, how do we solve that? Where's my Swiss Army knife? I'll, and, and, you know, that I think has traditionally been our, our, 
our role. We're not ideological, but I think this, you know, I'm all in favor of democracy, and don't get me wrong for a minute here, but, but you know, uh, it's not a secular religion either. And uh, I think, uh, to me, it's the far and away the best way to protect human values, including human rights, and I, I recommend it for everybody, everybody. But for us to be going around smacking places that somehow didn't get it the first time or trying to introduce it with the tip of a bayonet, it doesn't work. I, I mean, like a lot of things in life, it has to be accepted by the uh, recipient of the message. Uh, and so I think to some extent our country needs to calm down a little. You know, this, I think one of the biggest problems is this kind of notion we have is, as victims. You know, I mean, for most of the world, when they look at America, they don't think of us as, you know, victims. But for many Americans, you know, well, we're try tired of people pushing us around and running up their trade surpluses with us, and we just can't, you know, on and on about, you know, that we're somehow the most aggrieved country in the world. And, uh, you know, there's this, so, what's that country western song, I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. At least you know you're free? I mean, how about the biggest houses in the world, the best in income in the world? I mean, what's the matter? Why do you say at least? There are a lot of great things about this country. And so, to some extent, it's going to involve a kind of regaining of our self-confidence. Uh, and we need that because I think a lot of it is lacking. We lack in self-confidence. And we also, you know, uh, I think we have the best model. We sometimes mix, make mistakes, but I think we have the best model. And let people come to that view rather than go around yelling at them until they get so sick of us. They say, sure, sure, we accept. They don't really accept. So I think we just need to calm down a little talk to each other a little more, be a little more tolerant, even when we have screwy ideas about things. I mean, you know, um, I used to think it was, you know, with everyone in America having a baseball team, we kind of kept this sort of uh, ethnic strife confined to, uh, you know, Yankees versus Red Sox. And unfortunately, baseball is in demise. So I guess the problem is we're sounding like other countries in terms of our divisions. So we've got to get over it and uh, get serious and understand that, you know, the best way to persuade someone is just that and have that person say, you know, you make a good point. Let me give it some thought. I think I'm coming around to it rather than to yell at them and tell them you'll never talk to them again. So thank With you that, very much. Thank you very much.